So we have our keynote speakers coming up. Um, we have quite a few, and I really would urge you to uh, to get your questions ready. Participate, join in. I know it's it's always a little bit sleepy uh, straight after lunch, but uh, but yeah, let's try and try and uh, engage with our presenters. So uh, first up, we have Professor Marike van der Brink from Radboud University in the Netherlands. I know I went for the easy option. I really did. <laughs> Thank you. And she's going to be discussing gender equality in academia, challenges and pathways to progress. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for this lovely introduction. And thank you for, first of all, of inviting me, of course, again. Thank you so much. Um, also, thank you for being here and not at the beach yet. <laughs> Um, so I know it's always a diff difficult time slot just after lunch, especially when it's a bit hot and you had a nice lunch and you're in comfortable chairs. So hopefully I'm still be able to attract your attention and I really hope that we have a discussion afterwards as well. I cannot promise that I know the answers, but at least we can share our experience, experiences because there's a lot of experience in the room, right? Okay. So for today, I'm going to talk about, it's very broad, uh, gender equality in academia, challenges and pathways to progress. Right, we're all searching for the progress, we're all trying uh, things and we uh, learn by doing stuff. So, but first to get a kind of um, starting point, um, I would like to start with talking about gender inequality regimes, so to really, get a grip of understanding universities and research institutions as gender inequality regimes. So what are those about and how can we change gender inequality regimes? So then I turn to equality plans because those are one way of attacking, challenging the gender inequality regimes. And I focus on one gender equality practice, which is mentoring, which a lot of you are experts on, right? So to start again the discussions about what mentoring can do and how can we organize it. But I need your expertise for that as well, right? So I'm... Okay, so... Um, what I tend to do is to um, talk about gender inequality regime as a seven-headed dragon. So here you see the dragon with seven heads, or actually in the picture it, the, he, the dragon hasn't have seven heads, but imagine seven, drag, uh, seven heads. And the challenge is, or what we see happening if um, gender inequality is a seven-headed dragon. When we, when we slay, let me see how I can do this. When we slay one head of the dragon, then another grows, a new head grows somewhere else. So gender inequality regimes, seeing universities as gender inequality regimes, shows that it's a very difficult, it's about structural, it's about cultural practices, it's considered uh, imbued in the structures of the organization, of the research institutions, of academia. So it starts us off by showing that it's a wicked problem, what some social scientists uh, call gender inequality. Right, so Joan Ecker, who is a sociologist who coined gender inequality regimes, she, said, she argues that each organization is a gender inequality regime with all kinds of inequality practices, the different heads, um, that, are in, that are interrelated and create inequalities along the lines of gender and ethnicity and age and disability and sexuality. So that's very important that we, that we start off there. And although I know you cannot read it from the back, these are, for instance, some uh, examples of gender inequality practices. So we know that there is um, bias in teaching evaluation. So women face very often in their teaching evaluations that students comment on how they dress or how they speak in terms of their voice. 
We know from a lot of research that there is bias and no transparency in, in promotion procedures. We know that there's a gender division of academic service work. So women take up a larger proportion of the invisible, non-promotable work in academia. For instance, being in uh, serving on committees or um, informal mentoring of young colleagues. Um, and it's not helping their, them in advancing, advancing in their career. But we know from research that women do most of this academic housework. We know that there is sexual harassment and bullying and power abuse in academia. Um, that face, women face, and that women have less material, material resources, lab space and finances. So this is what we know. I'm telling you nothing new, right? But it is the fact that the monster is so multifaceted, that the monster has so many hats, it makes it so difficult to beat. So we have to think about what kind of swords do we need and how do we make the swords very sharp, right? That's what we should um, discuss. Also what I want to say, if I talk about men and women, then of course it's not a binary idea of that all men or all women, um, I mean I talk about, we know from studies that on average women for instance do more academic housework than men do. It, I'm not saying that men do not do academic housework, so just to, to be clear about that. Okay, so to beat this dragon, um, we have the gender equality plans. Um, and although, especially in the, the UK, uh, there have been uh, all kinds of gender inequality plans all for a very long time, and as our speaker this morning already told us that since uh, 2022, the European Commission now has uh, installed the mandatory gender equality plans in Horizon 2020 program. So we're making progress in um, universities and research institution, institutions implementing gender equality plans. So that's really good news. But we also know when we look at about what kind of academic knowledge do we have about the implementation of these plans, most of that research comes from the UK or from Germany or from the Netherlands and not that much from uh, Eastern or Western Europe. So we don't, and, and it's very context specific, of course, how an, a successful implementation of these plans take place. So we should know more about it. And colleagues of mine who are, oh, you cannot read this, right? But they wrote in a, a report on what they call the widening countries. So it's not my label, it's the label that the European Commission um, has called countries that were less involved in the um, framework, se frame, seven framework program and Horizon 2020, and includes countries like Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Serbia, um, that have been yeah, less part of it. And it's important that we also gain knowledge from these countries uh, to understand how we can successfully implement the gender inequality plans. So these colleagues did it. So I don't have time to go into detail, but if you're interested, please take uh, notice of this important and interesting uh, research report. What they concluded, for instance, so they, they took notice of the local knowledge. So they used reports written by people in these countries. And one of the things they concluded by this uh, overall review is that in many countries, as also in Romania, gender equality has a very low priority. And one of the reasons that it has a low priority is that the number of women academics is quite high comparison to, for instance, the Netherlands or Germany. But we also know gender uh, uh, equal representation is not the same as gender equality. So we can have 45 or 50 percent women um, uh, researchers, but it doesn't mean that there's no bias in teaching or research or sexual harassment. So we cannot stop, even when we have an equal representative of um, women in research institutions and universities. 
So that's one of their main conclusions. And also that they uh, noticed that the gender equality plans uh, are considered external measures in conflict with autonomy of researchers and institutions. So there is resistance also to implement these gender equality plans because they argue, and that's not different, different from countries, for instance, the Netherlands where I come from, that people say it's our institution, we know best um, how to deal with equality and especially with the meritocracy. But because the, the myth of merito meritocracy is still very strong. So the belief that only merit will be the one, be the thing that um, y y helps you advancing in your career. So it's not about who you know, uh, it's not about who you are, it's solely about merit. But we know from a lot of research that that is not true and it's a myth, right? It's also about what kind of opportunities do you get during your career? Who do you know who can open doors, who can talk about uh, you in a nice way? So. Anyway, that makes the implementation of these gender inequality plans a bit difficult. Okay, so if you read the report, and I'm not going into detail, and although you cannot read it here, they have identified several supportive um, factors for a successful implementation of gender inequality plans. And luckily, also in the speeches of this morning, we saw some examples of, of those uh, successful um, factors, like a broad mobilization of stakeholders, so you know that there are many people involved in implementing these plans, that the HR departments are part of it, the top management has support, and that learning is central in communities of practices. They also um, introduced the hindering factors. And uh, some of them are self-evident that there is a lack of resources, that there is a lack of support from leadership, um, that there is a lack of access to institutional data, right? That's also what they talked about this morning, that they don't have a good, uh, especially when we talk about beyond gender. Um, resistance within the institution, but, and this is what I want to focus on, is a limited scope of gender inequality policy. So I'm talking a little bit about that very often we have nice plans and great intentions, but sometimes the implementation is not really, you know, as we would have wished for. Just a question in between. Am I, can you understand me? Yes? Okay, good. If not, then please raise your hand, right? Okay, so my, my more critical question for today is, are gender action plans just a formal policy? So we know from studies, again, especially from uh, UK scholars, that talk about the performance paradox. They say these, these gender equality plans are in place of universities showing that they think that they say it's very important um, but that the that they don't really address structural inequalities within their institutions so in my words uh, they don't really slay the dragon or it's with a very blunt sword right so they make the impression that things are changing but change is sometimes a bit um, disappointing. Um, Yarrow and Johnston, they have this wonderful expression or a, a concept that they, they use, they call, they call it institutional peacocking. So that's why the beautiful peacock is here on the picture. And they say gender, this is, that they talk about Athena Swan, um, but I know that Aline, uh, Professor Drew will a little bit, talk a little bit more about Athena Swan. But they are quite critical and they argue that these Athena Swans um, are also a kind of institutional peacocking, showing how good you are, but that behind the scenes, um, structural inequalities are not addressed. And some scholars even say, aren't we still fixing women too much? Aren't we still putting the responsibility of change on women? So not only as change agents, so the ones that are driving the change, but also that we still have an idea of that women have to adjust to the dominant norms and the dominant practices, right? So we still 
teach them how to beat the system and not how to change the system, which is, of course, is inherently difficult, difficult but still. Okay, so that's my story for now. So what I mean is we know that we, have, we deal with a very difficult problem. We know that we try, we have best intentions. We, there are many people of you here also in the room that do everything to you know, make small steps. But it, might, it, it is difficult. And what I want to focus on in my last uh, part of the presentation is, so what can mentoring then do? Right? So again, because we have a lot of mentoring expertise here in the room, what can mentoring uh, do? Um, and here I have a picture of the human net uh, people. It might be an older pictures, picture. But there is quite some experience about what mentoring programs have been able to do for gender equality. Right? So, mentoring program as a gender equality tool or measure. Um, so, we know from a lot of evaluation studies that mentoring programs work. Formal mentoring programs actually um, benefit, women benefit from uh, these mentoring programs on an individual level. Studies show that their career development, it advances their career development, uh, they, they gain more visibility within the academic community, uh, it helps them uh, in their performance and their job satisfaction. There are studies showing also that their well-being of women is better because of the mentoring programs, the peer mentoring, the support that they um, gain from these mentoring programs, and there's the, it's good for the retention rate. So, women leave universities to a lesser extent. So that's good, right? We also know that there are some critical studies that say, okay, but we have to really think about how we design mentoring programs because we do not want to reproduce the system. We want to just, we do not want women just to, um, or that senior academics just tell women to do as what they did. So, you know, the same, uh, inequality practices are still reproduced. So we have to be really careful um, not to fall in, into that trap. And again, I know that many of you have been thinking about it, have been designing these programs that do not reproduce the system, but open up possibilities for, for change. Um, because I think that is the main, and I hope to get more discussion and input from you, um, on this is how can how can we you know make these mentoring programs transform the organization how can we sharpen the blades of the mentoring programs to to beat this seven-headed uh, dragon so some scholars call, call it systemic change or structural change transformational change inclusion I mean there are several ways of how people talk about it but I think that's the key question that I want to address uh, today and I have a kind of idea how these mentoring programs can actually do this in three ways. And now let me check time. Okay. Um, three ways that mentoring programs can transform organizations, can have sharper swords to beat the dragon. First of all, I think it's critical that we build critical gender insights with mentors and mentees. So what do I mean with that? Again, I will, I will uh, read out loud the, the quotes that I use because I know that it's going to be difficult in the back to read them. So building critical insights uh, with mentors and mentees, what I mean here is that people understand that gender inequality is systemic and intertwined with organizational practices. So actually, the way that we started, that I said, well, um, we, we have to talk about gender inequality regimes, right? Understanding the whole university system as gendered, right? It's not about, not only about getting more women adjusting to the system, it's trying to understand to how to create more inclusive environments. And this is something that is especially crucial for the mentors. So a lot of my my thoughts are actually about educating mentors and not so much mentees. Um, many of, um, or many scholars and also people present here in the room have talked about m mutual learning, 
right? That is not only about the senior person telling the junior how to actually manage or do science or how to survive or how to thrive within the academic system, but that there's mutual learning. And what we see from studies is that a mentor, for instance, um, has many mentees. By listening to their stories, they might actually learn about systemic gender inequality. So this is a example from a study from Jen de Vries, an Australian scholar who is also very uh, or is very knowledgeable about mentoring programs. And a mentor told her, I have discovered that all my mentees over the year had the same experiences. They all have difficulty getting hurt in meetings. I began to observe these meetings and recognize the dynamics with which made it so difficult for women to make the contribution. So the main message here is that the mentor realized that there was systemic gender inequality going on in the meetings. That was the main gender insight that these mentor um, knows, learned about. So here we see that is, um, it's not so. It's not about I help my mentee within the system. No, I'm I really understand what this is about. And I, I can give you many examples, but we don't, I'm, I'm, we don't have time for that. But there are many examples where we see that mentors learn as well if you um, stimulate that. So my main message here for the first way of gaining these critical insights is train the mentors. And I know it's difficult. I know there are challenges because the mentors, they don't have time and they're not willing to show up to these meetings that are organized. But training the mentors is crucial. And also from an intersectional perspective, because there are more and more scholars also talking about how to integrate intersectional perspectives into mentoring programs. Authors argue it's key, train the mentor, be aware of their own structural position. They should be aware of their own structural position, their privileges in the academic system, and try to understand the experience of the mentee. So does that, does that make sense to you? Um, and another two authors say, argue it's important that mentors acknowledge where their knowledge may be limited and remain open to learning. But this is a switch, right? It's not about, ah, you are the senior person, please, please transfer your knowledge to the junior. No, 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 it's really activate them and make sure that they're open to learning as well. Again, which is a challenge, and I'm, I'm dying to, to hear from you uh, about your experiences. So the same authors also say we have to encourage intersectional awareness among mentors because if we, for instance, read the experiences of um, ethnic minority women, they very often argue that they don't have a click with their mentor. The mentor did not understand the challenges that they were facing. So there was a kind of, the relationship did not really evolve or was stalled because, you know, it was not the person couldn't really understand what they were struggling with. Okay, second way of how mentoring programs can be transformational in terms of changing the academic system instead of uh, fixing women. Collective uh, agenda setting. When we have this group of women who also have peer mentoring, then it's a wonderful opportunity for them to exchange these experiences that they have in a safe environment, which is critical. I'm not sure whether you have seen the documentary, oh, what's Picture the name? Scientist. Picture Scientist. And here um, we see a qu quite a dreadful um, stories about women that were harassed during their careers. But we also see Nancy Hopkins, a biologist from MIT, and she is telling us that by coming together with other female uh, academics, they notice that they are not the only one. Ah, so you face that kind of things as well? Ah. And they collectively wrote a letter to the university board by saying, there's gender inequality going on here, and you have to do something. And they did. 
So by only by meeting each other, because especially in the STEM fields, it might still be quite, feel quite lonely sometimes, but by coming together, sharing experiences, teaming up, collective action was possible. Because we all know how difficult it is as an individual, as a single person, to beat a dragon, right? Because it's very um, risky um, to, to, com to, to talk about harassment, uh, to talk about things that were, w w when you suffered inequality, it's difficult. But if we team up, we can actually do something. And this is what we've seen in research as well. Uh, mentee Susan uh, argues, we noticed that there was a supervisor who did not treat his students very well. I mean, forms of intimidation, sexual and sexual jokes, sexual and sexist jokes, undervaluing women's students' input. They did not dare to report this to the dean as it might harm their career. But as a collective, we dare to say something about this and an invest investigation was started. So again, there is a lot, a lot of potential in this collective uh, peer mentoring, getting the people together, letting them talking about their experiences and collective action. Summarizing these stories to them and bring it to the people that actually can um, change something in higher management. Okay, third way that I think that a mentoring program can actually make small steps towards um, a better university. is first of all, of course, seeing it as a long-time learning process, but also to equip people, women, but also uh, mentors, to make small changes in the work practices. Right, so it's not about, it's, it's really about making, what can you do in your circle of influence to make the university more inclusive? So this is a, an example, um, which, which is a really small step, but it was very important for some of the people in his, or for, people, for women in his group. So the mentor John said, I never realized, but I had my lab meetings in the morning at 8.30. But there were always some women who were late or not able to attend. My mentee told me that this was exclusionary as it is very important to be available or to be able to, to be present. I now never schedule any meetings before nine or after five. So it's, it might seem minor, but it was important for the members and the exclusion of the people in his team. So what can, how can we equip change agents to make small steps? Again, when the mentors gain knowledge about inequality practices, we also equip them with making small changes within their research groups. Because otherwise, the challenge will, is so overwhelming. Creating an inclusive university, wow, I mean, intersectional. You know, you probably know how challenging that um, is. Uh, lastly, as another example of making these small wins, these small steps, is a mentee, Sarah, and she told us, I always was a bit shy to speak up during meetings. Being in the mentoring program gave me more confidence to speak up and to back up other women colleagues. Often we are not heard during these meetings and the credit credits go to the senior men. But now, if one of my female colleagues, for instance the PhDs or the postdocs, bring in an idea to, on the table, then I support it by saying, that's a wonderful idea, Bea, let's explore this further. It sounds so simple, but it really changes the atmosphere during meetings and we all feel more comfortable. Again, it seems so minor, but it was changing the culture of the meetings in this uh, research group. And this is what we want. We want people to be uh, e equipped to make these challenges be because we cannot do, make all the changes, right? We, also, we are limited in what we actually can do. Okay, so I finish with this picture and I want to... Um, show that we must be this person with multiple hands and arms and multiple swords that are very sharp to be the seven-headed dragon. And I think by teaming up, by collective action, we will be able to sharpen these knives and maybe one day, maybe one day we will not have these kinds of conference anymore. Anyway, um, thank you. Um, and I'm open for questions if we still have time.
Uh, hello very much. It was very interesting and managed to bring uh, uh, keep us awake. Uh, I've seen picture a scientist uh, twice even. Once it was a fellow um, screened by the uh, Gender Equality, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Group of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. And one it was uh, screened as a uh, European Geosciences Union, which has a mentoring scheme which I will present uh, tomorrow because it's mainly about uh, geoscientists. I remember I was uh, uh, quite surprised by uh, the lady uh, harassed by the guy after whom a mountain was named and then the mountain was renamed. And it's actually quite interesting uh, compared to what is happening now in Romania. Uh, there were some sexual harassment scandals at the uh, sociology university and it was uh, similar to uh, that lady. I mean, somebody when she reached a position had the courage and then many others who did not have so far uh, starting, uh, started telling uh, to me it happened as well. But I've seen a, a film which was very different when I was a student, a colleague, male, brought me to see the film, it's a German film called uh, Der Campus, where a lady says uh, she is harassed, but it pops out that it was an insanation and that she actually only wanted to make career speaking for women. And of course, and in Germany, people said, you see, uh, actually it's all not true. So I would like uh, to know if uh, anybody knows the film and what's the opinion on this. Thank you. Uh, Marike, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I'm scared as I, I am a professor at the University of Luxembourg. I have two questions and they concern men, but at different stages of their career. So the, when I was listening to you, the first thing that I was thinking is why don't we have mentoring programs for men PhD students and postdocs, right? It looks right now obvious that actually we need to fix right? Uh, the, the young researchers, the future researchers. My experience with them is that they have no clue about all what worries us, right? And, and they will become the, the future mentors, right? So um, is that a good idea? I mean, I can think of many reasons why maybe that would be very complicated, but should we think about mentoring programs for young men? And only young men, and what we are doing right now for women, but for men, right? Uh, precisely on this. And the second question concerns the mentors, but at the at a, um, a more advanced career uh, path. So uh, I would like to convince my colleagues to become mentors, and the way I can do that, right, especially for economics, but also other more quantitative uh, fields, is if I show them that there is quantitative research that shows how mentoring programs would impact positively their personal uh, career, uh, their, um, their self. Uh, that would be very helpful if, if you are aware of any that type of study. Thank you very much. Uh, short answer. So, Train young men, that would be wonderful. Or at least, well, I wouldn't, the thing is, I wouldn't make the gender division, but, but in all kinds of training programs that we already have, integrate the knowledge on inequality systems already. So they're all, they're all kinds of leaders. So selling a mentoring programs for young men only to create gender inequality, I'm not sure how many men, men really compulsory. A, a module that they have compulsory to validate before they get their friends. Yeah. Oh, ho, ho, that would be so cool. Um, yeah, why not? But we also know from, especially from the research on gender bias training, that gender bias training, when it's mandatory, can also have a very fierce backlash, uh, making them even more resistant towards everything that has to do with gender equality. Uh, so that probably might be the same. But in every kind of, um, there, are, there are so many academic leadership trainings, also for young uh, uh, researchers, there this should be part of. And not only talking about gender inequality, but intersectional inequality in that sense. Because of, because of course there are also men not receiving the amount of mentoring and sponsorship. Um, 
as others, right? They also might be disadvantaged in along the line of class or migrant status. So, but understanding that, well, actually, so the main thing is debunking the myth of meritocracy, that people say it's not because I am such a brilliant person that I became full professor. No, it's because I was surrounded. I mean, I might be have, you know, a talent for doing science, but also during particular times in my career, there were people on my way who supported me, who encouraged me, who told me to, hey, maybe this is a very interesting European project. You come on, um, you know, be in this application, at least when you're aware of being put on the application. Um, so this is, the, I think, the main, the most important thing that we understand that it matters who we are, what kind of chances we, we get. So in leadership programs, we have to uh, integrate that. And then for senior people, what did you say? I don't remember. Whether, whether, whether you are aware of quantitative studies showing the effect on the mentors. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know. I only know from, because I, I w sometimes also talk about sponsorship. So that's even the more active support of mentors, where they actually vouch for someone or or nominate people. We know from studies that uh, these sponsors do it because they get something in return as well. Mm -hmm. So when then the mentee is successful, it also reflects back on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they get information that they might on their senior position uh, are not able to receive anymore because people don't talk to them mm -hmm. uh, anymore in, the, in, in certain ways. And there was another thing that I don't remember by heart now. But so on sponsorship, there is something because that's a mutual beneficial relationship. Often, there is there are some studies that that saying, but I'm not sure that they are quantitative. So if I can add only one slide. So about the first point, of course. You will, we will not get many men coming to a, men, a, a compulsory mentoring program for gender equality, but if the narrative is that this is a mentoring program for excellence in research, uh, uh, then, then uh, they will jump. Uh, so I think the narrative is that we need to, it's what I'm trying to do at the, in Luxembourg, is to say that gender equality, especially when it's about content in research, means an excellent research. And then I see that yeah, yeah. their eyes become more yeah. attentive to what I'm saying. Yeah. I just would like to uh, support what Marieke said. I'm Katarzyna Cidlinska and I coordinated mentoring program for many years. I don't do that anymore, but still. Uh, we did a gender mixed program because in Czech Republic it would not be possible in 2014 to do mentoring program only for women. Even women did not want <laughs> this yeah, kind yeah. of program. And what was uh, unexpected for us and nice like a side effect was that when in the beginning uh, the young men and young women early career researchers phd students and postdoc spoke about their worries and plans for the future the men for the men for the young men it was quite eye opening that young women spoke about quite different things than them so it could be one way how to train future leaders yeah yeah Thank you so much. Um, I also want to connect to your question, Michaela. I'm from an Austrian university and let me share an experience. We have two programs for promoting women. One is the mentoring program and the other one is called coaching program. And these programs are uh, running since, I don't know, 2010 or something like that. So quite a long time. And both were w women only programs and then we decided for how to in include men and how to really mm, uh, uh, bring the awareness of uh, gender equality uh, better amongst the young researchers and the young colleagues. We uh, decided to open up uh, the coaching program for men. And not many men uh, participated but some of them did. And we have, uh, this program consists on, um, of coaching with a gender, explicitly gender competent coach and some workshops and also gender workshops, so workshops on gender equality and so on and so forth. And then we did an ex post evaluation f uh, of two or three rounds of this program, external evaluation, um, 
quite intensive with the questionnaire and also interviews. And what we saw is that first, men really used this participation uh, on the program much better than women. They really, uh, it was a career boost for them and not for the women. This is the first. And the other thing, when asked about what did you learn about gender equality, this, the gender equality, we didn't hear anything about gender equality. So it was an absolute career boost for them. And uh, at least uh, the evaluation results showed that the learnings the, for, in terms of gender equality, the uh, um, kind of awareness raising in terms of gender equality was really quite poor. So we closed it again, and we, well, I'm going to talk tomorrow about the things we did. I'm just thinking about, um, so for instance, the research of Claudia Ballon, uh, who is here as well, um, talks about new, new forms of fatherhood, for instance. So these are also ways that might attract attention, because especially the younger generation, I mean, I'm not sure whether that's the same in all countries, but in the Netherlands, you see that the new generation, they do not want to live the academic life as is quite common in senior positions, you know, working all the time. So there is more room or space to talk about new ways of work-life balance. I mean, it's a more a topic for them in a, new, in a younger generation than it was for for the, the, the generations that rule the universities at this moment, right? New norms of fatherhood uh, that are maybe also part of this, good part of this, yeah. It really is a question about how to connect the mutual learning that you're talking about on one of the slides. Um, do you suggest that we have quite a structured, formal way of training the mentors? Or do you think it could be more informal um, integrated maybe in this kind of 360 degree mentoring. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how aware you are of this um, reverse mentoring program that's happening in the UK where uh, the mentor is the more junior person or person with mm -hmm. uh, intersecting characteristics of yeah. disadvantage, discrimination and underrepresentation, mentoring the more senior person within that institution who is the mentee, so it's twisted on yeah. its head. Um, so do you think that this kind of uh, reversal should be integrated in all mentoring programs to make sure there is that mutual learning as a, as a kind of requirement for the program? Or, or well, do you think it should happen more organically? I, I would make it more structured. Ideally, it, it would be more st structured, mm -hmm. as, for instance, the reverse mentoring. But of course, many of you also probably know that it's sometimes difficult to get m mentors anyway. So if then this is part of the program, I'm, so m some of them would be interested, but others maybe drop out of their, as mentors. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the mutual learning should be very much facilitated and and um, being part of their journey when they act as mentors not that you say oh yeah gender equality yeah yeah i'm interested let me i, I can be mentor i can tell people how i did it um, that they understand that that's not the idea of the program and i also know because i talk to many of you how difficult it is to get the mentors to things that are organized. Um, I mean, I know the challenges, but it, it's something that we have to keep thinking on how to do this. Thank you very much. Ines Krizorsen, also from the University of Luxembourg. Maybe an add-on to that. One thing is that we're doing is that in the feedback, we ask the mentors, what did you learn? So even if they had not thought about it, mm -hmm. they will be prompt with the question. Uh, the other thing, and relates to also what Skurdy has done, uh, said, we have difficulties finding mentors, right? So some of our mentors are still quite junior, meaning they're assistant professors. They're more senior than the doctoral candidates or postdocs, but they're still quite junior. So the way that we are training them is to, on more of a coaching basis, meaning they don't have to have the answers, they have to be learned to listen and to acknowledge the difficulties. And this, for the mentors, they, we got the feedback, they, they really, 
it, it relaxes them, that they, mm -hmm. have, they go into these conversations and they don't have to have the answers. So that was yeah. a very good feedback that we, we got from training the mentors. And uh, what we also do, maybe just to share, is that for sometimes when they cannot come to the structured workshops, I do one-on-one. -on -one. So I go to their office and um, I give the training. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please. So I'll start while the PowerPoint is finding its way up live um, and like speakers before me say thank you so much for this opportunity to my first time in Romania and Constanta obviously and first time, uh, second time with this network uh, speaking at an event and um, I think it's wonderful that you've attracted such a great audience and group of participants and I hope some of you will have some questions for me at the end. Um, so this, what I'm going to be talking about is probably partly a personal narrative, a personal history, but also a, pro a professional institutional history um, of what happened. And I'm very grateful to our previous speaker, Marika. Uh, who has set the scene for what we were up against and what many of us will remain up against for perhaps decades to come. The things that had to be surmounted, the things that had to be addressed. And so my talk is going to be really a kind of compliment and follow on to that. Um, facing these, what do we do about it? So meeting the challenges outlined, providing winning strategies for structural change towards gender equality. So the outline is a little bit of background and milestones, which I think will confirm that we had a very bleak horizon in front of us uh, till maybe just over a, a decade ago. And, uh, but then the structural change, which started slowly and has been accelerating since. And I should also say that the changes that have been brought about those structural changes are not just specific to my own university, that's Trinity College Dublin as a case study, but many of them are reflecting the changes that are going on throughout the university sector in Ireland. It's been a time of monumental political, social, but also educational change in third level institutions. So how we went about it, based on our experiences, and highlighting the fundamental importance of two EU-funded projects. The first was an FP7 project, that was Integer, and that ran from 2011, which I take as a sort of our starting point, running till 2015, followed by following Integer with SAGE, Systemic Action for Gender Equality. And that takes us up to about 2019. So these were really of fundamental importance because when you have the money to activate change, people do not block you because it wouldn't look good, would it? You're in receipt of EU funding and somebody's trying to stop you. So we found we had the resources that would allow us to do the things that we believed were of such importance. So, by institution, I have to admit now that I was actually an undergraduate here, and I'm not going to say which decade, but it was a bleak, monochromic <laughs> kind of institution. Um, characteristic of it was I was in uh, the sciences faculty, and for the four years that I was an undergraduate, I did not have one woman lecturer. I mean, it seems unbelievable now. And yet, of my class, which was in natural sciences, it was about 50-50. So it wasn't that there weren't demands for natural science and learning. Um, it was that the providers had an exclusive club. And it was very, very male. So a very old institution, 1592, which kept women at its doors, <laughs> at the gates, till 1904. And there are great debates in this, the uh, board minutes of 
the arguments for letting women in and the dangers to the men that the women would pose. And it's a lovely story. It's a book actually called Danger to the Men, uh, written by <laughs> someone from our education department. And it, it is, and I mean, we have to remember, this was 1904, but Cambridge University weren't admitting women until 1946. So that's the context. So today, we have a rather changed picture. 60% of our undergraduates are now women. That's across all three faculties. 43% of all academic staff are women. And at grade A professor level, that's the top chaired professor in our system, 34% now are women. And that is a sea change. And yes, you say that's about fixing the numbers, but a lot more happened besides fixing those numbers. And a lot of work went into it, but again, thanks to having a starting point of resources to get up and running. So some landmark events. I've just taken a few. I've mentioned admittance, 1904. Women had to be off campus by six or seven in the evening and wear sombre colours. Um, it wasn't a very welcoming institution for those that did enter. But I think a key point of change, because we had set up women's studies, women's gender studies, we'd set up a centre, master's programme, an equal opportunity committee and lots of other, all the obvious things. But we weren't getting anywhere. We weren't changing anything. Same old attitudes, same old blockers and resistance to change. And the culture was still very, very masculine. So in that context, 2011 came along integer. And it was about institutional transformation. And we were able to develop the toolkit, able to develop the mechanisms to learn from and exchange experience. I'll come back to that. And wedged between that FP7 funding and the next Horizon 2020 funding, for which we were the coordinator, so now we were disseminating our learning, came Athena Swan. And that was of really important importance to us because we were finding our way we were looking for the best to emulate to say who's doing well in this way and what can we learn from that what could we adapt and introduce and let's get up and running and do it so then we can put something back in the pot and disseminate further so, just taking us back to those bleak old days, the reason I have 1984 here is not because of George Orwell, that's a coincidence, but that was the only year we could find. There were no data. I mean, you could just sort of say, what's, what's the gender ratio here? And even into the 1990s, we just didn't know. So, it was a lot of going back, trawling for head counts. And 1984 must have been some key year that somebody said, well, what is the, how many women do we have? And what grades are they in? So here we have chair professors, 5% women. And this is at a time when the number of chair professors wasn't much over 100. So when I asked a professor of German studies, Edith Sagara, you know when you were appointed, how many other chair professors were there? And she said, no, there was only me. So that 5%, more than likely, if I can uh, believe her, was one woman. So that, that's really how bad it was. Um, fellows is a parallel system to the promotion system and grade system. It isn't changing grade. Um, but it's uh, bringing people to apply for something that will uh, set them out as uh, having potential to be involved in the governance of the college and having special rights as university fellows. So you can imagine, even the language of our statutes was pretty much riddled with masculinity. And in 1984, 4 percent. So again, that was probably one woman fellow. And uh, yet, by 2001, you can see 33 percent inching up to 34 percent now of our chair professors are women. And uh, fellows have always been one or two steps ahead. And we helped that to happen during the integer project by having information sessions. Everything you want to know about fellowship, but were afraid to ask. 
And I can remember saying this to our provost at the time, and a smile came on his face because of the Woody Allen film. So uh, that suddenly brought a surge of women out of the woodwork, turning up for that integer-led uh, event to say, what's involved? How would I get myself elected to fellows? fellowship? What's, what do I do? And suddenly, we started to change things. We're not at 40% yet, but we're getting very close. Another indicator of how far we've come is up till 2011, there had only, there'd never been a woman president of an Irish university, never mind my own, and there hadn't, there'd been two women candidates. So since 1592, two women candidates, and suddenly, 2021, that's 10 years later, there are only three candidates, and all three of them are women. So that's a sea change event that I think was of symbolic as well as practical importance. So the woman who won, mechanical engineer, computer scientist, with a long-term, all three of those candidates had a long-term commitment to uh, gender equality and were quite unequivocal about making their views known. So that was significant, was picked up in the uh, news press. Her election has crowned a remarkable shift in the gender balance at the top of Ireland's higher education system in less than a year. And as I said earlier on, it wasn't just my own university. We were the first to elect a woman head. But now of the 13 public universities, seven are headed by women. So it's like from zero to seven, that quickly. And high caliber women leaders as well. It wasn't as if we were dredging somewhere or there was even positive action. This was women believing and running and being appointed. And that was, uh, again, a, a, a very important uh, time. So our gender equality plans were the mechanism from 2011 to getting to where we are now. Uh, what do we have achieved and how we achieved it? So here are some, this is our framework that came out of our integer project, FP7. And we started with four quadrants. This has been an evolving model, but uh, we added to it then the detail uh, of what uh, will be essential components, and we've heard some of those. I saw this morning in the, the, the talk uh, that, uh, that was coming, be, being, 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 dim. oh yeah, 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 I remember, I remember, yeah, that stage, of those things that we did, falling into different areas. So it was about changing the way the university was led, the policies, practices, and procedures, uh, and also trying to help the underrepresented, in this case, women. But could be the model could be used to extend through intersectional uh, means. So this, is, this became our model. We called it the integer wheel. And it was a way of seeing visually the array of actions that would need to be taken. It was no point in just concentrating on leadership or concentrating on the career, career progression of women if you left the others empty. So we had to populate that wheel with sets of individual actions that would be uh, instrumental in bringing about that change. And you'll see at the core, which again evolved through, is Dis gender disaggregated data. It was now no longer an excuse to say, we don't have it. And people in HR and people in student registry all had that initial response, oh no, we wouldn't be able to give you that. <gasps> no, no, we don't have it. So now we made sure that it was being collected. And things like, there were still problem areas. Who's on job share? Who's taking a career break? Who takes sabbaticals? What's the workload distribution? And that had to be done at a local level, school, department, discipline, to find out the numbers. People were doing, going around doing head counts and scratching their heads and thinking, we, we, we've never collected this before, which is no longer an excuse, because now you just have to collect it. And that brings me to Athena Swan. So 
under these different quadrants, going back to some of those headings, and I've just cherry-picked some areas where we concentrated our effort. But remember, this was being driven by the data. Where do we have a shortfall? Where can we dem demonstrate this discrimination, unconscious or conscious discrimination against women or men or other groups? And how do we rectify that? How are we going to address that? So just collecting the data became an annual monitoring event. And eventually, we got the state funding body to require it of all universities. But again, it was the pressure coming from the institutions um, in Ireland, uh, two of which also had FP7 funding. Project FESTA, some of you may have heard of, and Project Genovate. So you had three universities who were saying, OK, the time has come, uh, and we can now lobby for this to be done, rolled out across the sector. So getting buy-in at the top was very, very important. We had a newly elected university head, our provost, elected in 2011. He had done the Harvard uh, Implicit Association test and admitted he was biased. I thought, that's good, you said that in public. Um, and who we invited to integer exchange of experience meetings and turned up. And somebody mentioned Nancy Hops Hopkins, picture a scientist. We invited her over to tell the MIT story. And we sat the provost, because he was sitting beside me, to sit through and hear her story. And that was pretty powerful as well, because she did two talks and she did press coverage. Uh, and um, it was very, very important, very significant, because it showed that you can be a top university, but you can be riddled with sexism. And that's what Picture a Scientist shows. And if you haven't seen it, you must. I've seen it at least three times. So getting the provost on board, getting the vice provost on board, and he appointed a woman, uh, was very important through video, written, online messages, getting them to, to attend, getting them to speak at an event, and to welcome Athena Swan. So for the first time ever, we had a strategic plan that only mentioned gender, but mentioned Athena Swan and the leading role we would be playing uh, in developing Athena Swan and adapting it to Irish institutions. So this was the video. These are uh, two visual clips from the video uh, where the provost was speaking and the vice provost, incredibly eloquent vice provost, I must say. As a university that's committed to excellence in research and education, we are absolutely certain that having a commitment to gender equality, we will enhance the excellence of all our activity. So we always emphasize, because we knew the resistance, the whole meritocracy myth, um, we have always held the claim and seen it proven uh, in terms of the outputs, particularly the awards and research funding that's come and expanded um, through developing gender equality, giving the opportunity to everybody in the university community. Then uh, decision makers and unconscious bias, we've heard this mentioned before, um, and yes, the resistance to it <laughs> when it's compulsory. The only one that's compulsory was if you were going to be on an appointments or selection panel, you had to have done an online training. And that was devised not by my university, but across all the institutions, all the universities. And some people did object. And if they objected and wouldn't do it, they would just drop from the panel. <laughs> it was just very simple. OK, we don't need people like you. <laughs> You've already declared yourself. Um, but the others were um, sort of voluntary. I asked the provost, I said, Unconscious bias, you know all about it, <laughs> being an expert, um, having done the IA IAT. Um, so I said, well, shouldn't we start at the top? A senior management team, get somebody to talk about unconscious bias and why it has to be eradicated. So I said, yeah, sure. If half an hour, that was uh, Paul Walton from York University, no better man. No PowerPoint, no, 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 no. So people came along, you know, from uh, sort of top brass and just sort of sat there thinking, why am I here? But by the end of it, we're really inspired. 
and the you know the provost was delighted with how it went. So when I said, well, next next stop is the promotion committees, junior and senior promotions, and he said, yep. Yeah. And again, we could pay for different consultants to come in, external consultants from the UK to come in and give it. And the provost turned up, and the deans turned up, and all of the management team turned up, as well as the promotion committee members. So it meant that all of these people were making key decisions about the career progression of men and women in our institution had had exposure. And then we rolled it. I remember the fellows one. I was so embarrassed. Somebody put the hand up and does this mean we have to be politically correct? That we can't make sort of sexist jokes? Yes, it does mean that. <laughs> I am still embarrassed. These white men, <laughs> all ca white Caucasian men, uh, asking, you know, well, this is going to spoil all our fun. But uh, they, they, they have uh, come on, on board. Heads of school and unconscious bias observers. And this is going on through the Leru network and my work with Lund University. But peer mentoring was another aspect of mentoring that I think we saw as very important. We wanted to get the good practice experience from the best. So looking at the United States, the National Science Foundation Advance Award holders, and in the UK, Athena Swan, uh, uh, Charter uh, uh, Bronze and Silver Award holders. And it turned out that really on a much smaller budget, the UK universities had really taken the lead, and they were the, the highest quality universities in the UK, and they still are very prominent in, te in terms of keeping their leading role. Because some of them are in Leru and have had very highly developed gender equality plans. And it's very interesting to see those that are, have been generated through Athena Swan and the other Leru uh, universities that have developed, you know, a gender equality plan that just wouldn't stand up against those. So that was again a great learning exercise. This was the promotions committee, uh, mostly men, uh, that must have been senior promotions. And so the next thing we had to tackle was the policies, looking at is there sexism here, is this doing what it's supposed to do, is it having the effect, do we need to change it, do we need to introduce missing policies. So we introduced a gender expression and gender identity policy, which is already being reviewed and uh, improved. And of course, the Athena Swan Bronze Awards. Uh, we were instrumental in getting all the university sector together and stakeholders who are very, very important, umbrella bodies, research funders, get them at the table and say, should we go this route? Should we devise our own um, mechanism? Uh, award and we decided no go with something that's already internationally recognized and we have made great progress so from starting point 2014 when it was launched by the minister for education uh, we applied in 2015 and we were awarded uh, first of two institutional bronze awards renewed in 2018 so I know the blood, sweat and tears that went into that because I worked with a writing group for the institution with an Athena Swan team and I know exactly what that involved. So I've been able to hand that over and since then the silver application has gone in and we will be awarded it in November this year and Trinity will be hosting that event. So it has kind of mushroomed from nothing in 2014 to an awful lot of students. And internally, 18 of our 24 schools also hold a school bronze award and two of them have silver. So again, we've kept that leading role, but we've also shared our experience and worked collectively with other uh, institutions and universities as well. And this was haha, our provost, uh, some of you might recognise him if you were at the Gender Equality in Higher Education Conference in 2018. And um, that was basically, uh, he was very, very pleased and said, where do we go for gold? I mean, very naive, but still. So he's been overtaken by Linda. Um, and getting to know your, the structure, the gender disaggregated data was very important. So some of it was all internal, but 
it had never been disaggregated by gender. But also, we had to do surveys, and they have now become an annual data collection to, uh, source, so they can flesh out what the other statistics won't. You know, the responses that were open-ended, the qualitative responses, and what, you know, the gripes and the, this isn't working well here. And that goes into an an annual monitoring report. And again, this is now a requirement for the entire sector. Every university has to submit its gender disaggregated data to the higher education authority, the funding body, or they will have their funding cut. So very simple. And it's funny how when you have to do it, you do it. So going back to has there been any change? And again, OK, this is the numbers game. We had the usual scissors diagram of, you know, we've had more, we have more female students for, for maybe a couple of decades. But at the end of the line, when we come to the grade A professor uh, level, we see the gap really was widening. And the good news is, and this isn't the most up-to-date figure, that by 2021, we were moving closer and closer to being within the 60-40. And that was a major change because the intake of first, because there are four grades in the UK and the Irish system. So it's a slow process to get to uh, full, full chair professorship, but uh, that has been improving. And one of the um, incentives was that in 2016, the Higher Education Authority, our funding body said, okay, we're gonna conduct a review the review recommended every university must appoint a vice president for equality. You will aim to have 40% of all your grade A professors women and put an unrealistic year in it, but we've had an extension of that. Um, and every university must apply for and get Athena Swan bronze. So basically they took what was coming through our collective efforts and institutionalized it. So it's very hard now to wriggle out and say we don't need this. Um, and it, it, that, that, that remains in place. So we watch this now annually. And uh, this is, uh, again, other areas of decision making. Heads of school used to be an exclusively male group, uh, but now nine women out of 24, 15 men. And that yo-yo's about so we get considerable variation in that. Um, and in decision makers, again, these change from year to year because some of these at least are at the discretion of the provost. But you'll see two women vice provosts. So that's, you know, the three top people in the university are now women and uh, uh, in other areas. The woman who became provost had held the post of dean of research. And in fact, that was a post held by the two previous male uh, provosts. So it was a key one because you've got your finger on where the, the research funding's coming from and how to influence it. Career progression, mentoring, <laughs> when's she going to mention it? Um, we found that uh, there was already a mentoring program in place and they trained mentors. They had a mentor training program. Uh, and this is when we were pursuing um, uh, the Aurora project. Um, and that has now been joined by early career mentoring uh, at assistant uh, professor level, that's old style lecturing. Um, and that is to ensure that all incoming staff, male and female, so mentors can be male, female, so can mentees. It's just there's no discrimination at all. Um, that they know they start to learn the ropes as soon as they're appointed and there is somebody to lead them along. But it was Aurora, which we found in the Leadership Foundation in Cardiff University, were running a women only. So this is one of the few women only activities that we included under Integer. And it was saying, like, women are underrepresented. They need this extra leg up. And in the beginning, I think it was about 2014, we had to almost beg three women to go on it. And it meant send, flying them over to the UK, because it was a UK programme. And uh, it, was, it was difficult, it was costly, but we had the resources to do it. So since then, a decade later, there is always 
there are always more applications than there are places. And it's funded either by the university or the school of the applicant or uh, a research funding centre or project will find the money. So the individual doesn't have to cough up anything. So now there are 30 people every year who go on those. And it has started to, again, um, encourage uh, not only the mentoring that had to be given, but also the networking amongst those women. And it's across institutions, and it's also led to networks within institutions. So the whole combination of that training, mentoring, and networking has been very, very powerful. And people will, years later, still be talking about Aurora was, you know, really for them, a very, very, very personal milestone. Other areas of career progression were boosting the visibility um, of women academics through people coming to speak, like Nancy Hopkins, um, academic leadership I've already mentioned, but also videos of researchers, getting people to talk, put it up on their website, why I became a researcher, why I'm excited about science, about the opposite of picture a scientist, and hosting of the Gender Equality in Higher Education Conference, which I think the one or two people attended. And <laughs> this is, brings us, a few of us all together, the, uh, the usual suspects, with the provost now very pleased again that uh, this is uh, the Long Room Library. It's, it's a very beautiful place to have had our reception. But you might recognise the woman on my right. Yes, so former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, a Trinity graduate and was then our Chancellor of the University and still has you know, a very strong interest in what we're doing. And when it comes to your countries, I just saw it last week, there's a film called Mary Robinson and you can see again the story of what she was up against and why she just stuck at it and was not going to be defeated. So that was you know, just one of those moments in my personal life and I hope others. But other areas of visibility. So this is about the culture and showing what women could do and were able to do and, and praising it and in celebrating it. Um, so we made a video of women who had been recruited in the 60s and 70s and it's on our website and I'll give you the link to that at the end. Um, and certainly the stories, oh my God. It was like Picture a Scientist, but uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, so we launched it, and it was the year of Yates, so we called it All Changed, Changed Utterly, because I wanted to say things were bad then, but at least they're getting better. And there we have our foundress, Queen Elizabeth, so there's a strange irony here to juxtapose her against our Chancellor of the University. So we launched that on International Women's Day. And another thing we did in terms of culture is just, again, to give visibility to the inputs of women in another area of culture, in this case film, and have film nights where there was a woman producer, director, actor, whoever it might be, story of, uh, and in this case it was the Frida, Frida Kahlo, the uh, Mexican artist. And uh, so academic staff, male, female, could just select a film, bring along their DVD, and we sit and watch it, and they talk through it. And it was just a nice way of getting something uh, uh, embedded in the culture of, yeah, there's so much going on out there. We just have to see it. And then work-life balance, that's already come up because it's, it's been quite difficult. Um, sabbatical term without teaching for people returning from extended leave. We pioneered that under integer in the Faculty of Science and Engineering uh, because coming back from that leave, very hard to pick up the pieces of your research when you go into your teaching load. And we found some bad practices, like you will double up before or you will double up after. That's your research career gone down the swanee. So we picked up this in data collection terms and said, no, this is what we want. And we didn't say it's exclusive for people for coming back from maternity leave. It could be people coming back from sick leave, protracted sick leave or a caring, caring leave for a parent or a, a partner. So we didn't make it exclusive to women and we got it through. And it was supposed to be rolled out, but I'm, I can't vouch for that. We had zero paternity leave. 
Uh, but now we've got 10 days. And uh, core hours, this has come up about the, um, the men mentor finding that mentees couldn't attend. So core hours, that was actually hard fought. But it was really important to get that, and that had to go right through to the board of the university. So some lessons, and then I'll close. Gender disaggregated data, you have to have it, and that's already been said this morning, because if you want to prove there's something wrong here, you have to be able to demonstrate it quantitatively. And if you have qualitative data as well, which Athena Swan puts a great emphasis on, what are people actually saying? out there on the hustings. Buy-in, top, down, but also bottom up. And that was through our team structure, which I'll mention next. That Athena Swan had said, you know, this is the way teams should be. Senior, junior, academic, non-academic, and also uh, student representation and uh, gender mix, obviously. Uh, so that team structure we'd learned from the University of Edinburgh when we set out uh, setting up integer teams. Incentives for men. I do agree men have to see something in this for them. And sometimes it's just like, we want to support you and we want to visibly be on your side. Uh, so involving them as champions. So Athena Swan teams, there's a lot of work involved in those and chairing them. So when we had our four teams, three school teams, one institutional team, for our first application for Athena Swan, two were headed by men, two were headed by women. So again, we were trying to kind of practice the gender balance and not let the men off the hook, because, you know, the work has to be done, it's got to be shared out, the housework. Um, capacity building, recognising that women needed uh, perhaps an extra uh, leg up. I thought by now, 10 years later, maybe we would have run out of any need for Aurora, but it appears not. Um, and raising gender awareness. Unconscious bias training. You have to keep going through that cycle. And again, in Athena Swan applications, you have to explain who has been exposed to it, who needs to go next. Uh, mainstreamed, coordinated gender equality plans goes without saying. And the importance of communicating success. Because we can always, somebody's saying, uh, negative emotions and negative messages, you'll find this through social media, get much more airing than the good news and the positives. So that's really important that we get them out, that something good is happening. Mentoring combined with networking, peer mentoring, learning from the best and replicating, and then EU funding. It was <laughs> instrumental. <laughs> So uh, the last slide is just the follow-up, the book um, that I've brought along, if anybody wants to have a look. Um, it costs in hardback about 135 euro, but the good news is, because again, thanks to our uh, European funding, it's available online for absolutely nothing. So that's the link that will take you straight through and uh, there's a lot more t material in there. And if you want to go into our Trinity website, there are training modules towards a gender sensitive university um, and that include mod, um, sub modules of unconscious bias, change management for gender equality, um, and I've, uh, yes, and the gender dimension in research. Um, and those have been very good starting points and I've certainly put them to very, very good use and I hope you will too. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Drew. Does anybody have any questions for Professor Drew? Thank you, Professor Drew, for the very interesting presentation. Um, I would like to ask, uh, you mentioned that um, the national uh, framework in Ireland yep. um, institutionalizing the Athenas one as well was basically responding also to the practices emerging collectively. I would like to understand how did you achieve this? Was there some kind of also talking across these universities or was it like individual action in parallel by universities? How did you achieve the collective momentum? Well, um, it's better be cut if it's going to be in any kind of edited version. Uh, we knew that the then head of the Higher Education Authority, a man called Tom Boland, uh, was about to retire and that he had realised that he dropped the ball, to use his expression, on gender. Um, so he was speaking at an event in Trinity and a colleague and I said, let's go up, get him to come to the pub for a drink 
and then tell him he's got to do something about gender. Now, I'm sure we weren't the only people getting this message across, but in Ireland, getting people to have a drink with you is a very good way of persuading them that something has to be done. <laughs> So we then followed that up with Integer, we were first dissemination uh, seminar, and we invited the minister, uh, Aidan O'Riordan, who's now an MEP uh, for Labour Party, and we invited Tom Boland. And uh, we thought, well, we'll put him in the spot. <laughs> and uh, he just suddenly, out of the blue, said, I've arranged there will be a review of gender equality. It's about time, we realise we've fallen short, and it's going to be chaired by the former European Commissioner, Moira Gagan Quinn, a formidable woman. Uh, it was the DG of Research and Innovation. She will chair it, and it, it will be, the secretary to it will be Gemma Irvine, who's now the, one of those assistant vice, uh, provosts in Maynooth University for EDI. Uh, so once those names were mentioned. And he said, it's, we're gonna break some eggs. <laughs> you know, to be you know, as polite as he could about it, we're going to uncover some bad stuff. And the review report, which again, I can add in and, and let you have the, the uh, reference for, is downloadable online. And it ha there's a survey of over 4,000 academics and some wonderful quotes absolutely wonderful quotes and that was out of it this isn't good enough and these are what we now are going to require and because they were the funding agency for the entire sector you know how could you ignore this so that was really really powerful but during that process of review they invited about five members of our national Athena Swan committee so representatives of about five or six universities, and Maura Gagan Quinn was in the chair, and we said, these are some of the things you need to do. You know, institutionalize Athena Swan, make it a requirement for funding. So we were dropping things, we were lobbying. And that's, I think, how you've to build that pressure, but you've also got to have your data, you've got to have some political pull, there's got to be some incentives. So again, we were able to say, look, we've used our money, EU money, now it's time that Ireland, the Irish authorities, do their part. So building on, yeah. You call it, could call it Machiavellian, but as I say, I hope this is edited out. <laughs> yeah. Any further questions? Like how many people is the we? How many people? Is the we. Like how many people were you working with or starting the with or drinking, drinking with a... Oh, two, <laughs> like two, two of us. Myself and Sarah. We still remember that moment, yeah. <laughs> Any further questions? Thank you very much, Professor Drew. Thank you. Thank you.